everybody, and welcome to another edition of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, thumbs up if you like the video, share it. You know we got a mission, and I'm definitely here to be the voice of the voiceless. But today we're going to talk about a man that went to prison when he was just a teenager. Started his life of crime at the age of 19. And in my view, became the most dangerous, violent prisoner to ever set foot in a prison in the United States. He was truly the man of blood on the razor wire. He left blood on the razor wire at every prison he went to. He didn't care who you were. Didn't care if you were a prisoner. Didn't care if you were a cop. But if you violated, he had something for you. And what he had was a knife. What he had was something to strangle people with. He was a murder machine. So who is this guy? They say he was one of the original members of the Aryan Brotherhood. Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Silverstein had served a small bid in California at San Quentin at the age of 19. Got out of prison and in no time he was robbing banks. And by robbing banks, he ended up with a 15-year federal prison sentence. In 1975, he walked into the Bureau of Prisons. The Federal Bureau of Prisons had welcomed Thomas Silverstein into the belly of the beast. And when he walked into that belly of the beast, little did he know at his young age that he would never walk out, at least not a free man. Somebody would carry him out. He would leave prison only when he died. But how'd that happen? While serving his federal sentence, there was a man that run afoul of the Aryan Brotherhood. It's alleged that the Aryan Brotherhood wanted this man to bring drugs in or to mule drugs in. And he refused. He refused. He thought he was tougher than the Aryan Brotherhood. Well, it turned out he wasn't. Thomas Silverstein had took his life. And as a result of taking that man's life, he was sentenced to life in prison. While he was serving that life sentence, he was appealing the case. And eventually, Thomas Silverstein had won his appeal. Winning his appeal meant that he'd probably end up getting out in 1982 because the life sentence was gone. But that would never happen. Because while that appeal was pending, Thomas Silverstein had struck again. This time he had killed one of the D.C. Blacks. He had killed Robert Chappelle. Strangled him through his jail bars. Strangled him until he took his last breath. Robert Chappelle had seen death through the eyes of Thomas Silverstein, the most violent, dangerous prisoner to ever walk into a prison in this country. But the D.C. Blacks, they wanted blood. Cadillac Smith, the leader of the D.C. Black Gang, he had put the rumor out in Marion that he wanted Thomas Silverstein's head on a platter, that he wanted his blood, and that he wanted to be the dude to take Thomas Silverstein's life. These were two bad dudes right here. Thomas Silverstein against Cadillac. There was plotting. There was a lot of planning. There was conniving. Somebody was going to win. And that win meant that somebody was going to die. And you know who died. Cadillac Smith died in a violent nature, in a barbaric nature. Thomas Silverstein with his right-hand man, Clayton Fontaine, stabbed Cadillac Smith over 67 times. And once they killed him, once they stabbed him to death with prison shanks, they did something else. They drug him down the tier. They wanted everybody to see their violence. They wanted everybody to see what would happen if you threatened the legend. Thomas Silverstein. Cadillac Smith had made a mistake. He had put it out there. He wanted people to know that he was going to kill Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Silverstein, true to form, wasn't letting it happen. Was not letting it happen, and he wanted to exhibit that for all the other prisoners to see that Thomas Silverstein was not the man to threaten. So now Thomas Silverstein was locked in a cell 23 hours a day. But he wasn't done yet. The killing machine was still running. And one day, on his way to a shower, 
He stopped by another prisoner's cell while he was being escorted by guards. That prisoner used a homemade handcuff key. Yeah, we make those in there. He used a homemade handcuff key and unlocked Silverstein's cuffs at the jail bars and slid him a shank. And as they walked down the range, Silverstein's blood began to boil. He knew that this was his time. His time for the ultimate. The ultimate. Kill. That's when he had killed Merrill Klutz, a federal prison guard. He decided to stab him to death, and that's what he did. And some people wonder, why did he do that? Did he do it just because he was a violent, angry man? Let Thomas Silverstein tell it. He'll tell you that he did it because he was being abused by this officer, by this guard. That this guard was stealing his mail and throwing his mail away and throwing his pictures away. And just being plain old nasty. Some of them guards are just plain old nasty. They think they can treat you like shit. They think they can kick you like you're a dog or like you're a prisoner in a third world country. Silverstein had had enough. Kind of like those animals you see at these circuses back in the day when people would beat them or dogs. Finally, they had enough and they lash out. And that's what Silverstein did. He lashed out and he took Merle Klutz's life on that tear, stabbed him to death. But that wasn't the only thing that happened that day at Marion. His partner that we just talked about, Clayton Fontaine, he decided to follow Silverstein's example. And on that same day, just a few hours later, he too stabbed a correctional officer to death. Took his life. Left his blood on the razor wire right there, right on that tier, in that Marion prison. And some of you might know about the ADX Florence, but they say that was the house that Thomas Silverstein built. They built that because of him they wanted to find a cage that they could put people in and leave them there for the rest of their lives. And Thomas Silverstein had spent his life in a solitary confinement cell in Marion. He was transferred to Atlanta after those murders. And he was locked in a gray, gloomy cell, like the stuff you see on them old prison movies. There was a little light bulb hanging from the ceiling and probably water running down the wall. And it was probably killing him inside, deteriorating. He was being tortured. But somehow, Silverstein remained mentally strong. Somehow, he remained normal, if you could say that. I mean, how do you say normal about a man that was a killing machine, right? How do you say that about a man that was the most violent, dangerous prisoner to ever set foot in a prison in this country? Some things happened later on in Atlanta while he was down there in that hole. There was a riot, the infamous Atlanta riots. The Cubans had took over the prison. They were tired. They too were tired of being abused. Thomas Silverstein got out of his cell. He got out of that solitary confinement cell, and he was roaming the prison. He ran into another guard. <laughs> you think he killed him, right? Nah, he didn't kill him. He let this guard go because he said that that guard had showed him compassion when he would cuff him to take him out to the rec yard for his one hour of rec five days a week. He would ask him, hey, are the cuffs too tight? And because of that simple gesture, Silverstein said that he spared that guard his life. Eventually, the Cubans would negotiate with the staff and the BOP. And what the BOP wanted was for the Cubans to get Silverstein and turn him over, capture him again. And I'm sure the Cubans might have been scared that he was out roaming too. He was unpredictable. He was a lion among lions. He was a wolf among wolves. Perhaps he was the master wolf, if that's even a term. So anyway, long story short, they capture Silverstein and get him back in his cell and eventually... In 2005, he would be moved to the ADX prison. He would spend the rest of his life in that prison cell at the ADX, the house that Thomas Silverstein built. It took him all them years to make it there, but eventually he made it there. And while in that cell, I'm sure he was deteriorating. I'm sure he was angry. I'm sure his blood boiled, and I've read a lot of his writings and seen some of his art. You can see it in his artwork. The anger, the frustration, 
the pain, the desperation. Perhaps there were times when he regretted some of the things that he'd done. Perhaps he reflected on his life and how he went to prison for 15 years and ended up with life. Some people think when you walk into prison, you got a sentence and you're going to walk out when that sentence is served. For some, they're murdered, they're killed behind those walls. For some, their seven, eight year, nine, 10 year sentence becomes a life sentence because that's where they're going to die at. I've seen plenty of people walk into prison with short bids and end up with life for killing people, just like Thomas Silverstein. And I'm sure there had to be times when he was sitting in that cell all alone where he said, damn, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe that my actions resulted in me never getting out of prison again when I started with 15 years as a young man. I'm going to die right here. I'm going to die right here in this cell. But those thoughts don't take away from the legend. They don't take away from the brutal violence that he unleashed. For whatever reason, whether it was justified or whether it was simply because he was angry or simply because that's what he wanted to do, simply because that's who he was. Thomas Silverstein was a legend. He was a dangerous man. He was feared by many, loved by few. We've all heard that saying, right? Well, that's true when it comes to Thomas Silverstein. That's exactly who he was. He was a man that was feared by many and loved by few. And I know that when he took his last breath, he had to have reflected on his life. Sometimes I think about Thomas Silverstein and I wonder if he died angry, if he died in a state of depression, if he died in a state of hopelessness, or if he was at peace when he died. Was he happy with the course that his life took? Was he satisfied? I don't know. But the one thing that I do know, for me personally, the facts stand alone and represent themselves. To me, Thomas Silverstein was the most dangerous, violent prisoner this country has ever seen. But for real, I'll let you decide. You form your opinion. And for those kids that are watching Blood on the Razor Wire TV, think about this. Think about this dude that was 19 years old. We could say he was a man, but he wasn't. He was just a teenager following someone else's lead to commit robberies. And what happened? He ended up dying in prison. You don't want to be that 19-year-old, do you? You don't want to be that guy that people talk about and say, man, he was a badass dude. Yeah, but he died in prison. You don't want to be that badass dude if it means you're going to die in a cage all alone. Do you? Think about it. Bringing it real, bringing it raw, blood on the razor wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out of here.